Everything is so interconnected, particularly with all of the different crises we've experienced. It's reinforced the urgency of, of the need for us to all take collective action. It's been very inspiring to see leadership that cities are taking to connect the dots between food policy and other social justice movements. Hello and welcome to the Power of the Public Plate podcast, brought to you by ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, and the UN One Planet Network, with your host, myself, Josephine Hinz, based in ICLE's Berlin office, responsible for global initiatives of sustainable, innovative, and circular procurement. And I'm Peter De Franceschi, running ICLE's Brussels office and global food program. ICLE is a European and global network of local and regional governments committed to integrated, sustainable development. And the UN One Planet Network works as a multi-stakeholder community across six programs, one of which is committed to the implementation of sustainable public procurement globally. In this podcast, we explore the stories of champions of food procurement around the world. In each episode, we bring you insightful and inspiring stories of how the public sector can influence the food value chain by leveraging its purchasing power. Join us as we talk to public sector staff, policy advisors and experts to learn how to support smallholder farmers, serve healthy and nutritious meals, source locally and climate friendly. Welcome back to our interview with Bertrand Weber and Alexa Delvice. Yeah, welcome back. This is the second part of our talk about the USA's food procurement system with a special focus on school feeding. If you missed the first part of our conversation, make sure to check out the previous episode where we had a first introduction to the Good Food Purchasing Program and the food public procurement process in Minneapolis. This time, we explore the lessons learned and how to work effectively between national and local levels. Let's jump back in. Here are the Lexa Del Vice and Bertrand Weber. I'm actually really curious to hear from you, Bertrand, how was it for, for you in, in Minneapolis to engage with the Good Food Purchasing Program? And kind of, did you, I don't know, um, also uh, had some challenges at the start? Like, were you surprised by, by um, what, what you found, kind of joining the program, what it meant for Minneapolis? How, how did your journey look like? We were really excited to to have our first assess, assessment done. And I must preface that we follow the program. The district has not adopted the policy. It is not a board priority. It is our department's priority, and the district embraces it, but they don't actually have adopted the policy. I just want to be transparent. But we follow it. We follow everything with or we're following the Good Food Purchasing Program. So I had, in the past 15 years, worked on many different aspects of farm to school and procurement and worked with manufacturers and, and developed standards for ingredients and nutrition standards and everything else. So we were really excited to get the first assessment and were devastated when we got the results because we... We thought we were so far ahead, and we went, oh, my God, we have so much more to go. And it was the most incredible document to help us make the next step because it highlighted things we didn't even think of. When we got, for example, a a report of all of our manufacturers that had labor infraction, we would have never known any of that, right? So now... Now we're aware of those things and we can make decisions based on whether we want to procure from a company who has so many labor violations. Uh, the, the, the Good Food Purchasing Program has also and, have, and, and gave us flexibility, for example, we were working with many farmers that follow organic practice, but they're not certified. So from the standard, from the, the program perspective, they did not, uh, they didn't give us the point in that value, if you will. But now we're at the point where we're working together with, with the, the program to have those farmers, although might not have the capacity to be certified, 
but through a self-evaluation where the farmers certify that they follow those practices and we as a district have verified it, then we can qualify those farmers. So it really helps everybody because not everyone has the capacity to get certain certification. But so every year when we get our assessment, and it's, it's gotten better, even through COVID, we were surprised that actually we, we gained some points in some areas. But we sit down with the team and we set some objective for the following year. Where do we need to increase our focus? Uh, you know, we will never be able to do 100% local produce because I live in Minnesota. That's just a reality. So once we cap that category, where else can we go? Is it, you know, is it local wheat? Is it bakery? Is it protein? I can't afford grass-fed beef on a regular basis. It's not going to happen. I only have a dollar sixty to feed my kids, right? But can I increase the number of time I serve grass-fed beef by leveraging some of the USDA commodities that come our way and kind of creating a balance? So the evaluation, the report is just an amazing tool that helps us move forward. But I said that when we first got it, we're also bummed because we thought we were doing so great. But it, it motivated us, and it's kind of part of, okay, let's, let's get to the next, the next step. And we've debated back and forth. With, I, I have not always agreed with some of the standard from, from GFPP. And, but, you know, it, it, it's back to partnership. We have to build that partnership my goal is, is always don't develop standard that is not sustainable that you'll never achieve. You've got to start somewhere and then build them up. And that's what I, I tell all the districts that are asking me. Is that start small. You, you will not reach everything, but start small and build on it. I think there are a lot of uh, happy listeners, hopefully, um, being motivated by, by your story that you just shared. It's, it's beautiful how you frame it as essentially a learning curve and, and not being devastated too much, but actually getting motivated, even if um, the current practices are not top notch. Um, is that kind of often the case? Or like, so when, when new public authorities approach you, where should they start? Like if a city now is, is motivated and is keen to, to implement more sustainable procurement practices around the food um, purchases, what will be a good starting point? So it's, yeah, all about baby steps. And I think that transparency is, it doesn't sound as transformative as it actually is, but just getting an understanding of what the current reality is, is, is quite empowering. Um, and beginning to see the, the system as a whole and think about different issues um, that you never have before and had no um, insight into. So the transparency piece, the, the data, using data as a feedback tool to begin to prioritize. I think it, you know, often, often we reassure um, institutions that their baseline assessment, which is how we always start, is completely consistent with what other institutions are experiencing all across the country. And it's not a function of one institution's inadequacies. It's, it's consistent with the way all of our supply chains look. And so, you know, that knowledge is power just beginning to set achievable goals. I was also wondering, we talked about linking it to strategies and to certain goals there might be at the local or regional level, you know, health, climate, uh, biodiversity, you name it. But what about the education? Do you also link procurement to education about what is healthy food, where the food comes from? So the Good Food Purchasing Program, one of their pillars is nutrition. I don't, I don't think that there is a particular uh, standard around uh, education in a school environment, and this is our own personal in Minneapolis only, that we focus on using our cafeteria as a classroom, if you will, in educating what good food looks like, what good food is, where it comes from. We really don't focus much on nutrition 
we find that that turns off teenagers and kids and everything else. But if you focus on good food and changing, modifying and changing their eating behavior from processed food to whole food, you will automatically make an impact on the procurement process by shifting the demand. That's how we do it, is promoting it from a good food perspective and basically shifting the demand because students will now go from chicken nuggets to chicken on the bone. They'll go from thinking ketchup is a vegetable to eating local apple kohlrabi slaw. So I'm not sure I'm quite answering your, your, your question, but it is focused on education, but not by saying this is healthy for you, this is nutritious. It's more about this is a great local apple. It comes from 50 miles from the Twin City. You can actually go pick it next weekend with your family. And here's a recipe with kohlrabi, which you probably never had, and apples, and it's just fabulous. And we've been successful. One of our, I always use that as an example because I think it's funny. One of our most successful kind of new offering came from a local restaurant. And I saw on the menu they had a roasted beet hummus. And I said, oh, my God, we got to try this. It's the most popular thing on our salad bar before COVID. It's bright pink, right? And you would have never thought that kids would enjoy roasted beet hummus, but they do. So we're making a shift in procurement by changing kids' palate. No, indeed, that answered my question and uh, made me also think about the uh, healthy or unhealthy food, because it's true, I hear some time ago, I talked to someone and about the public school canteen, and they said they did an assessment with the children and they complained the uh, the food was too healthy <laughs> and uh, it's also true when I see my daughter or, or kids of their age, the most exciting thing is uh, basically the, the unhealthy food, let's call it like this. But then again, I have uh, uh, just, just a friend who I, he has uh, regularly au pairs from the US and I'm surprised that all of them are actually vegan and uh, it seems especially un Among young people, there is this trend of, of, of vegan, uh, whereas, let's say, older generations discuss about the human right almost. We had such an issue in, in there were some issues in, in, in cities as well, the human right to, to having meat. There's an outcry if, if let's say, public purchasers dare to start uh, talking about uh, plant-based uh, menus, even if it's just uh, one, twice a week. So how, how is that... Uh, Is there, is, there an, is there an open mind about uh, plant-rich food? Is that uh, moving on or is that still something uh, too sensitive to, to tackle? Uh, and I'll answer in our last assessment, one of the strategies to reduce some of our issues with protein is to focus more on plant-based protein because animal protein, we can't afford the high end animal protein, the sustainable one. So we're shifting to plant-based protein. We also have, and you mentioned that there is a, an increased demand from our population for more plant-based, uh, plant-forward meals. Uh, so we have started right before COVID hit, we actually had a a three-week pilot that we were working with high schoolers. They developed the marketing campaign. We were working with uh, Forum for the Future uh, on a marketing campaign with students uh, around plant-based. We have a logo. We have a poster. And then the world came to an end the week we were, started, we were supposed to start. So it's slowly emerging back, but we have a whole portfolio of plant-based protein, not meat analogs, but really plant-based protein. We're not serving, you know, the, the hot dog or the, the fake chicken nugget. It's chana masala. It could be a lentil crumble. It could be a pea protein crumble. But we have about uh, 30 plus, and it is now on our menu that every day there's a plant-based alternative at all the secondary schools and a vegetarian 
vegetarian vegetarian option at the elementary school. I see. I think it's there to stay. Uh, and the primary objective from the students was not health, but it was the planet health, the sustainability, not their own. That was actually um, a question I had for you, um, and and you you already started talking about this, this kind of um, very much kind of planet conscious lifestyle that is emerging by the next generation and kind of linking procurement to tackling actually the climate crisis. How does that translate? How do you navigate this complex task through food procurement? Kind of how, where do you see opportunities for public authorities to reach, to achieve the climate targets through sustainable food procurement? Maybe Alexa, if you want to to go first with kind of an overview. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that intersectionality between food and climate and racial justice and and health equity. I mean, it all, everything is so interconnected and particularly with all, all of the different crises we've experienced over 2020, 2021. Um, It's in for, reinforced the urgency of, of the need for us to all take collective action. And so it's been, it's been very inspiring to see leadership that cities are taking to connect the dots between food, food policy and other social justice movements. And so in play, um, I think a, a good example of this is in New York, where Last week, the Mayor's Office of Food Policy just released their first ever um, citywide goals and strategy for implementation of um, good food purchasing. And it's all focused around um, connecting the, the purchases of I, the city of New York spends upward of $200 million dollars a year on food. And what they're doing is outlining targets that they want to achieve connected to um, you know the five core values but extending it to climate impacts and and um, you know equity impacts and and so what they'll be doing is they've they've released all of their data and the targets that they want to achieve over the next 10 years and then they're tying those 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 targets to a um, citywide strategy for um, how they will advance policies, public investment, et cetera, to increase their purchase over you know, the next 10 years and the types of state and federal policies that also need to change. Um, so they'll be working collectively. And it's all around connecting food to bigger sustainability and um, justice goals. Thank you for, for outlining that so clearly. I was also wondering, since uh, this project is part or based on a, on a report that UNEP did on the influence of uh, procurers on the entire supply chain, where do you think, which are the stages where there is more leverage or more specifically, what is the impact uh, and the role that procurers can have? Perhaps to, to clarify a little bit, kind of about the, the understanding is, and we talked about this, that there's a huge leverage to influence how the food is being grown by working together with, with the farmers. And um, I guess other stages would include how it's being then produced and processed, how it's being transported. Those are two other stages. And then there is kind of the whole uh, consumer stage. And then finally you have, for instance, the kind of um, waste, like food-based um, stage as well, how to influence that through procurement. So given these, just to make it a bit more practical, given these different stages, where do you see the most leverage in the U.S. context for purchases to make an impact? What's coming to mind as you're talking, and, and Bertrand can speak to this much better than me, but it, it seems like um, just over the last year and a half, with everything, with the labor shortages and supply chain uh, disruptions associated with the, the pandemic, it has been primarily the national supply chains that are, are disrupted. And in places 
where there are strong regional relationships with producers, the the disruption has been minimized. I mean, it, it still exists, but it's been minimized. And so it really builds the case for why it's so critical to invest in infrastructure all along the supply chain regionally to withstand the disruptions that we know are going to continue um, for many years, particularly with the climate crisis. And so I think those investments in local processing, uh, distribution, wholesale, um, kitchens, et cetera, that, that is what will create more resiliency. So I'm not sure if I completely answered your question, but I think it's it's procures and our public institutions can can address all of it. It certainly has been, I don't, I don't know if there's a word that can describe the experience that we are still currently experiencing with the food system. And you're, you're, you're right on, Alex, the, the, our smaller producers that we work with, we've had much less disruption than some of the large manufacturers. Uh, unfortunately, right now, and it's not really directly related to procurement, but the labor shortage uh, has created a lot of the food shortage and labor and, and supply chain issues. It's not the lack of raw material, it's the lack of, of available labor to manufacture and get the product from point A to point B. But I can still get my burgers from my local turkey guy because he's a you know he's got his own truck and he's got his own drivers. We're not relying on a much larger system to move his so we actually just had a meeting yesterday going through our menu to identify potential replacement knowing that we're going to have shortage in some others and every replacement that we're doing is with a local process yeah that's really clear and really insightful to kind of highlight the importance of localized supply chain and how that really boosts the resiliency of them kind of the, the supply side of things and, and the influence as well that you then have directly um, on, on the value chain. And I think that being mindful of, of your time, and I think we, we covered so much ground already, um, I do want to learn a bit more. What, what is next for, for you in Minneapolis and Alexa for the Good Food Purchasing Program? And, and also I think um, what we always do in these episodes is to ask for your words of wisdom, if you like, um, to give kind of a few um, recommendations to fellow procurers or advisors of what do you recommend? So what's next for us? We have one big project is we're building our own processing facility for fruits and vegetables so that we can provide a higher price for the product we sell to the farmers because I can eliminate the middleman. So that, that's a, it's been in the work for two years. It's been kind of on hold. So that's kind of a big project. But the other one is just trying to get back to normal. We've had to make so many compromise in uh, in what we do that's been extremely frustrating. So getting back to normal might be a nice next step for us. You know, anyone who, who, who thinks that we can't change the food system. And I remember 12, 14 years ago, I thought every manufacturer's and big food act were the enemy. And I fought with them all the time. And over the course of the years, I realized that it's better to be inside the belly of the beast than to fight it from the outside. The Cargills of the world are not going away. They're going to be here. So how do we work with them to better our food system and our procurement practice? If we're going to fight them from the outside, they're bigger than me. They're going to win. If I'm inside their belly, I can help them make chunk change. And I've seen it work. So in Minnesota, you know, we have Cargill, we have General Mills, we have Genio, we have Hornell. We've got who's who in food. So I've seen some changes. And they're, they, whether I like it or not, I've got over a million dollars from them to help me change my food system in our school to do better for our children. Fifteen years ago, I would have never gone to Cargill and asked them for half a million dollars to help me build a central kitchen. So I've learned that I think we need to work with them rather than fight them. And and that applies to all of us. That, that's a big lesson I learned about 10 years ago when I finally calmed down and said, okay, I need to work with them. I can't keep fighting this. 
Yeah, working in collaboration, that, that's, a, that's a very good recommendation. Thank you. How about you, Alexa? Yeah, I think in terms of advice, the, the importance of those cross-sector partnerships, so bringing together the institutions, the policymakers, the advocates, the value chain businesses. I mean, it's this, all of this work depends on partnerships, relationships, trust. That is the way we'll be truly transformative. Um, and I think in terms of what comes next for us in uh, at the beginning of this year, we, we released our recovery roadmap and in it, we included some very bold goals for 2030 that I think is very much connected to the moment that we're in um, with everything we're hearing from United Nations and the smartest, smartest scientists in the world around the types of um, changes we need to make at scale collectively. So, you know, by 2030, we would like to see the majority of public institutions in the United States and internationally, why not, committed to a set of values, making, you know, the true value of food and good food, the dominant narrative, and all public institutions are committed to those values. They're um, investing in the infrastructure, both the people and the hard infrastructure that's needed. And, and, and we do this and we get there by continuing to build and build across cities that momentum, um, scaling up to states and the federal, um, federal level. So continue to deepen and activate the networks and um, learn from each other and work with each other. That's truly amazing to hear. And I think by, by all what you share, it, it really sounds like it's time for sustainable food procurement to become the norm. And there are so many ways going about it. The time for, let's say, excuses is over. And uh, it's been really, really inspiring and valuable to talk to you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks indeed. What an interesting conversation. Really, there's so much to unpack more. And I think we could have spent hours to, to talk to Alexa and Bertrand. I fully agree, Joe. Like last time, to learn more about the Center for Good Food Purchasing and the Minneapolis Public School Feeding Projects, check out the episode description. And if you like this episode, you can support us by again sharing it with your colleagues and friends. We warmly invite you to check out the other episodes as well and to connect with us on Twitter or websites at the UN One Planet Network, as well as ECLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability. Thank you all so much for listening. Goodbye.